Welcome everyone. Thank you again for joining us today uh, for today's presentation, the history of the Ku Klux Klan here in Fresno. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our presenter for today. Um, today's presenter is Professor Patrick Fontes. He received his PhD in American history from Stanford University. His research interests include US immigration history, California Central Valley history, and the criminalization of Mexican immigrants. Dr. Fontes is currently researching the Chicano movement at Fresno State uh, during the 1960s uh, through the early 1970s. The University of Arizona Press is publishing his latest article in rewriting the Chicano movement, new histories of Mexican American activism um, in the civil rights era. So without further ado, our presenter today, Dr. Patrick Fontes. Hello, um, thank you for joining us. Um, I first wanna say that I am honored and privileged to um, have been asked to, to speak um, during Black History Month. And I feel the great weight of responsibility in handling um, this subject. And I also know that Black History Month is a time to celebrate um, our African-American heroes and their accomplishments. And I wish I were up here celebrating some of my black heroes, Nat Turner, Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass, um, Huey P. Newton, Malcolm X. Um, but given this, the state of affairs we were in over the last couple of years and, um, and race relations, I think it's important to, to talk about this subject. And, um, and the KKK in Fresno, I wish I were given five hours. I can talk for five, about five hours on this subject, but I only have 45 minutes. And so we're gonna talk about a, a few aspects of the KKK and introduce um, some African-American voices from early Fresno. So let's start way back with the KKK. The KKK was founded in 1865, some historians say 1866, um, right following the Civil War. In 1868, the KKK boasted over 500,000 members across the South. And here are a, a, a few early Klan costumes. Um, when the Klan first started, they didn't have the, the uniform they have today with the white hooded robe and, um, and the blood cross. So everyone made sort of their, their makeshift costumes. Between 1870 and 1871, Congress passed the Enforcement Acts which made it a crime to interfere with registration, voting, office holding, or jury service of blacks. More than 5,000 people under the Grant administration, um, President Grant, who was the, the Civil War general, under him, um, more than 5,000 KK members, KKK members were indicted in federal court, um, and more than 1,000 were convicted. So essentially the KKK was outlawed at this time during the reconstruction as the federal government imposed upon the South um, the great amendments we have that came out of reconstruction, the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments. This is, amaz this is an amazing number we'll cover um, a few times in this lecture. At its peak in 1924, which was the zenith of Klan membership across America, the Klan had be between four and six million members. I recently read a New York Times article from the 1930s which said eight million members. At this time in America, 1924, there were only 114 million Americans. So even at six million enrolled members, well, that's about 5% of all Americans are enrolled KKK members. And that's not counting the support, the community support they have um, that's the membership roles, which is an astounding number. This, this is an important point that we need to cover when we, we're dealing with the KKK, is white supremacy. And what we're dealing with now in our own society and culture and issues of equity and the storming of the Capitol and the rise of far right movements across the nation and around the world. This is the core issue, I believe, is, is this idea of white supremacy. And this is a foundational document in American history, I think that um, every high school student should know, every um, 
college students taking American history. This is one of the foundational documents in American history. And I think we don't teach it because this was, this was created during the, the Confederacy. This speech was given by the Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens. And it's called the Cornerstone Speech. And in this speech, he explicitly lays out why this, the South is fighting the Civil War. Now, of course, you ask many Americans, and especially in the South, and many people in the South um, will say that the Civil War was fought over states' rights, that slavery was not the core issue. Um, but if you, look at the if you look at the documents of the time period that are coming out of the South, the South is saying it is about slavery. It is not only is it about slavery, it is about white supremacy. And I, I, I want to read an excerpt out of this speech before we get started on the Klan, because this, I think this really is the core issue when we're dealing with um, the Klan throughout American history and the rise of far right movements across the world at this time. And this is an excerpt from Alexander Stevens' speech. He says, the new constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution, African slavery, as it exists amongst us the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. The prevailing ideas entertained by him, jo Thomas Jefferson, he's referring, to the, he's referring to the original constitution of the United States. And most of the leading statesmen at that time of the formation of the old constitution were that the enslavement of the African was in violation of the laws of nature, that it was wrong in principle, socially, morally, and politically. It was an evil that they knew not how well to deal with. But the general opinion of the men of that day was that somehow or other, in the order of providence, the institution would be evanescent and pass away. This idea, though not incorporated in the Constitution, was a prevailing idea at the time. I'll stop right there. If you read the Founding Fathers, those who owned slaves, Washington, Jefferson, these men are grappling with the idea of slavery. Right? Jefferson and other Founding Fathers know that the, this, slavery is in opposition to the ideals that they're espousing that slavery um, is not the best thing for the future of America. And they're wrestling with this idea of slavery. Um, but Stevens is saying they're wrong. They grappled with this idea. They mentally wrestled with slavery, but they were wrong because slavery is the best thing for America. And he says those ideas, however, were fundamentally wrong. They rested upon the assumption of the equality of races. This was an error. It was a sandy foundation, and the government built upon it fell when the storm came upon the wind and the wind blew, which meant the Civil War. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is as natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. And the reason why this speech is so important is that it wasn't just a glimpse in time. It wasn't just this moment um, where the speech had an effect. The vice president, Alexander Stevens, was also in the House of Representatives through the entirety, most of the entirety of Reconstruction. And he was a powerful voice, a leading statesman during Reconstruction. And then he was governor of, of Georgia. So he was a leading voice, and his influence was felt across the South and across America. Keep this, guy's, keep this guy in mind. We'll touch upon him later in the, in the lecture. This is Nathan Bedford Forrest, slave trader, the first grand wizard in the Keg of the KKK. He owned and operated a slave market in downtown Memphis in the 1850s, after the Civil War, during which he served as a general in the Confederate Army. The first Grand Wizard of the KKK, a leading um, person during this time in Reconstruction, where he founded a group to terrorize uh, newly freed black Americans. 
Here's the early Klan costume um, before um, The Birth of a Nation came out and um, was a blockbuster hit in America in 1915. Um, Klan outfits were makeshift and they, um, we'll touch upon that a little later, but here's the interesting Klan costume from the early days. Question. Here's a question I want you to all consider and perhaps answer me um, at the end of the lecture. Why did the Klan form in December 1865? What factors led to a small group of men forming the Ku Klux Klan? Think about that right now. Why did the Klan form? Why do far right movements form today? Why did the Proud Boys form? Why do we see the rise of far right movements across the world, in Germany, in England, in America? Right, there's a Proud Boys chapter here in Fresno. Why do these groups form in the first place? Here's a short explanation. The KKK initially formed as a bulwark against the programs of the North in order to inflict terror. This is an important principle in order to inflict terror. Now, when I give my KKK lecture to my college students, many of them will say, I had no idea that KKK was so violent. What I learned in high school was that they harassed African Americans and that's all I knew. The KKK was formed to inflict terror and violence and, mur and murder African Americans, to keep them in a subordination, this, is, this very subordinate niche in society where freedom of movement, movement thought, economic progress is, was confined. Um, in society. In order to inflict terror on the newly freed four million African Americans in the South, to impose violence so that white supremacy continue to be the foundation of Southern society, denying any of the freedoms passed by the North, namely the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Through intimidation, violence, and murder, the KKK terrorized black communities for over 100 years. Now, I, I want to warn my viewers that I have a couple of slides of lynchings. So um, if you're triggered by images of violence, I ask you to turn your monitor off for a couple of minutes. Um, I think this is important that we know these things because this wasn't very far in the, this was not very far long ago. We think about the Holocaust only a couple generations ago. Um, I'll go on. Also fear. After the Civil War, think about this. I often ask my students to, have, to exercise cognitive historical empathy, a, try, attempting to place yourselves in the shoes of historical people. Now this doesn't mean the same thing as compassion or sympathy, but attempting to see the world through a particular person's eyes. Place yourselves in the shoes of an Alabama plantation owner or the wife of a plantation owner or the daughter or son. And you were brought up all your life thinking that these people were subordinate, they were subhuman, they were, it was God's order to enslave these people. And all of a sudden, four million African Americans are free walking around your streets without any restrictions at first. I think, I think there, was, there was great fear and anxiety in the South about the freedoms given to African Americans after the Civil War. So, and I, I, I looked at the 1870 census and compiled these numbers. It's amazing when you look at these numbers side by side. So I'll read what I wrote up here. This is the white population of the con former Confederate States in 1870. The total population of the South was around 400 million, I mean, sorry, 40 million. The total population of ex-Confederate states, around 9 million. The total white population of ex-Confederate states, around 6 million. So look at South Carolina. The total population of South Carolina is 705,000. The white population is 289,000. The black population is 415,000. When you look at these numbers side by side, you start to realize more fully why groups like the Klan were formed. If it, was, if, 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 if it was only about slavery, and after the Civil War, the 13th Amendment's passed, and slavery is wiped out 
once and for all. If it was only about slavery, then why not grant African Americans their rights if slavery was done in the way with? But it wasn't only about slavery. Slavery was the mechanism to ensure white supremacy. And after the Civil War, groups formed like the KKK and other groups to, to ensure that this very fundamental aspect of Southern culture live on white supremacy. And when you have 415,000 free blacks walking around a population of 289,000 free whites in South Carolina, there's great fear and anxiety amongst the white population. And there's a backlash. Um, and often it was violent. Here's an image from 1925, 1926. There was two great Klan marches in Washington, D.C. This is Pennsylvania Avenue. And some numbers say 30,000 Klan showed up. Some numbers say 50,000 Klan showed up. This is a, this is a well-known, two well-known uh, marches in Washington, D.C. 50,000 Klan showed up with their masks removed. This is at the height of the second wave of the Klan that starts around 1915 when the birth of a nation is showed across America and rises in popularity across America until we get to around 1925 and the Klan starts to lose membership around 1930. But 1924, 1925, 1926 is the height of the Klan. And here they are marching with their masks off. They're showing the world who they are. Um, out and all, all across America during this time in the 1920s, the Klan participated um, um, in parades. Um, many Americans saw them as, as a fraternal organization like the Elks um, Lodge. Of course, many Americans knew what, exactly what they were, but um, when you have up to 8 million Americans, 6 million Americans who are in the Klan, um, you, 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 you understand that these are average Americans living down the streets who see the Klan as a Christian organization, as the defenders um, opposing foreign immigration, upholding American ideals, um, patriots. All these ideals um, were imputed to the Klan during this time. Also in certain areas, especially in Fresno, the Klan was um, defenders of prohibition. They were, very, they were active, actively um, active participants in, in guarding um, prohibition in Fresno. So they were, they were seen as upholding morals and Christianity and good values, especially in places like Fresno and the West. Question, why do we study the Klan? This is an important question. Why do we, why do we study the, the groups like the Klan and the Nazis, and other organizations, we might, um, I hope most of us um, look at them as bad organizations, right? And, and see them as um, the evil type of um, influence they are in American or world history. But why do we study the Klan and groups like the Nazis? Is it just to um, gawk at violence? We think of the Holocaust and the Nazis and see program after program of the Nazis on the History Channel, is it only to, to gawk and sort of like this voyeuristic insight into the violence? Um, I, I think it's more important to study the evolution of legislation, where we go from Germany in World War I to the heights of the Holocaust, and study the evolution, the progression of laws and propaganda that take the German people to the point where they tacitly approve and outwardly approve of the Holocaust. That is real history, not gawking at the, at the violence. And I think when we study the Klan, it's important to understand why people are joining the Klan. It's easy, it's easy to set up a straw man and impute all these evil attributes and then push a straw man down, right? But when we really understand why people are joining the Klan, then we can look for similar historical waves throughout history and even in our own time period. 
So think about this, and perhaps some of you can offer your own um, insight at the end of the lecture. And this is something that many of my students find amazing. The Klan is allowed to exist. So General Grant took the Klan to court during Reconstruction, and one, around 1,000 leaders at that time were put in federal prison. And for a long time, the Klan went underground until we get to 1915, the 1920s, we see the rise of the second wave of the Klan. But why, ask yourselves this, especially during our time period now where um, all of this is being brought to the fore, isn't it? Race relations, we, we speak of equity in our college. What does equity really mean? Why do we need equity? Why, why do we even study? Um, well, what, what, what issues gave rise to men like Martin Luther King Jr.? Why do we have men like Marcus Garvey and Frederick Douglass and the Black Panthers? What, what society is, issues made those men possible? Right? They were all fighting against white supremacy. This is at the core of, 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 of many of these issues is um, white, white supremacy. I wish I could talk for hours on this. One of the first major settlements in Fresno County was called the Alabama Settlement. And this town of Borden was at the center of the Alabama Settlement. Um, the Alabama Settlement was made up of um, Civil War refugees, ex-plantation owners from Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, that fled the violence that was done to their culture we know those who studied the Civil War, right? Atlanta was in ruins. Um, many places was, were in ruins. Plantations were destroyed. Their whole culture was destroyed. And great portions of them fled and came to the Central Valley. They wanted to get as far away as they could from the federal government, west, but not to the Bay Area because that's where many Union soldiers were. And this, this constituted the last area in America where they could really um, go as far west as, from the federal government as possible. And if you look at the 1870 census, around 75% of the, the settlers here are from the Confederacy. And they were the first doctors, lawyers, sheriffs, police officers, teachers in Fresno County, and really set a foundation. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that all these people were Klan members, but they did come from the South, and many of them were ex-slave ho holders um, whose, whose culture was destroyed and came to really create a new South, and they brought their culture with them. Here are some numbers I, comp I compiled from the 1870 census. And it just shows you the influence um, or the power that the South brought to the Central Valley. And if you look at the census, you see that large groups came with each other. So there's large groups, large groups from Tennessee, large blocks from Georgia, from Alabama. And if you look uh, at the, those who are coming from the North, they come as individual families. They're scattered. And they're coming, they're coming into a culture that's really formed by the South. So, you, you see the difference in real estate values. I won't, go, I won't spend too much time on this. This will be on YouTube. You can look at this for yourself. But the, the economic power the South brings to the Fresno area is in many ways twice or three times as much as those from the North or the Union. And we know in American history, um, property values is what creates wealth, right? It's the investment in property and ownership of property. And this is what the South brings to the Fresno area. I won't read this because I'll, I'll run out of time, but here's an explanation of the Jim Crow era. This is very important to understand the time period we're studying. Now the next couple of slides are those slides that um, show um, lynchings. So I want to warn you, if you're triggered by violence, um, please shut your monitors off for a couple of minutes. But it's very important that we see this because um, this is what we're dealing with. And I often tell my students that um, hi history is often um, 
well, maybe the history I teach, <laughs> it's not happy history. Um, sometimes I ask my students, um, maybe if I'm teaching a, med a medieval class, I, I say, when I mention the Middle Ages, what comes to mind? And they'll say, knights or princesses and castles. And I'll say, what about not living to, not living to 30 years of age and all your teeth are falling out and you're living with cows and, and pigs in your house and you're full of disease and, right? Um, the reality of the human condition is often different than what we imagine in our minds. Um, so here's an image, and there's hundreds of these on, um, that are available. Um, the body of George Meadows, lynched near the Pratt Mines in Jefferson County, Alabama, 1889. Now, nearly 4,000 black men were lynched during the Jim Crow era. Now think about this, these are the only ones that are recorded. By police reports, newspaper accounts, these are what we have in record. I imagine that there are many, many more, um, especially black men, who were lynched during this time period that weren't recorded, that were done in the backwoods and everybody was hush-hushed about it, right? I imagine that's what happens. I've seen several of these photos where there's a young white man laughing in the background. This isn't the only unique one. Um, and it's, it's shocking. And it wasn't that long ago. Lynching of Jesse Washington in Wasco, Texas, 1916. He was repeatedly lowered and raised onto a fire for about two hours. A professional photographer took pictures of the lynching as it unfolded. Horrible, grotesque way to die. I already mentioned this, but I'll repeat it again. Between 1924 and 1925, the KKK had between four and six million members during its zenith in the early 1920s, mid 1920s. Although it enjoyed considerable support in the South, this is, this is amazing, the Klan was strongest in the Midwest and Southwest and California. Oakland, California, Anaheim, Fresno were three of the hotbeds of Klan activity in the 1920s. 1924-1925. On August 1925, 35,000 members and some estimates say 50,000 marched on Washington, Pennsylvania Avenue. Here are some numbers of Klan membership over time. Now, at this present time, Klan membership is a, is a low, but it's at a low because people who espouse these ideas are joining other, other far right groups, right? Like the Proud Boys, and there's a host of other, if you go to the Poverty, Poverty Law Center, um, they have a website where you can look at all the, the modern day far right organizations that espouse white supremacy and um, violence to African Americans and Mexican Americans and others. I already talked about these numbers. Um, amazing numbers. If 7% of all Americans <laughs> were Klan members, there are a lot of albums and closets <laughs> throughout America with gra great grandma, great grandpa, and, and Klan, Klan outfits. Um, that's an amazing amount of Americans who are part of the Klan during this time. 1924. It's no coincidence that 1924 was also the year where a, a major immigration act was passed and also the creation of the Border Patrol, right? As anti-immigration sentiment is rampant across America. This all goes hand in hand with each other. Question, what fueled the rise of the second wave of KKK membership across America? I already gave the answer away, right? Hollywood, <laughs> well, at first it was a book um, called The Klansman, and, and W.D. Griffith turned it into a, um, one of the first Hollywood blockbuster movies, um, The Birth of a Nation, a three-hour movie which was, um, which was advanced for its time period. Um, 
special effects amaze people. It was like going to a, a blockbuster Marvel comic book movie today. Um, the KKK was shown as the defenders of the South against um, an imposing North that wanted to rape white women and impose their, their um, unchristian values on the South. And the KKK was billed as um, these Marvel superheroes in a way. I won't read all these um, points about the birth of the nation, but they'll be on YouTube. Um, the author was a, a, cl a classmate of Woodrow Wilson, um, the president. They knew each other from, from grade school, or I think grade school, maybe college. Um, instant blockbuster hit across America. Incidentally, around 1910, 11, um, the birth of a nation was shown across America before the advent of the movie theater as a play. And this, this is not really taught or known about too much, but across America, the play was shown on, on, on stages. And this also um, planted the seed for the second rise of the KKK. And that play was shown in Fresno um, before the movie was shown in Fresno. Woodrow Wilson, now there's a de debate between historians. Some say he said this, some say he didn't say this. Um, but the quote is, Woodrow Wilson, this was the first Hollywood movie that was shown in the White House. It premiered in the White House, and Woodrow Wilson is said to have said, it is like, it is like writing history with lightning. And my only regret is that it is all terribly true. What he means that it's true that the KKK were heroes, that the North tried to impose um, their vile laws on the South, and the South has suffered under Northern rule. Here is a newspaper account um, from the Klansmen. Now, often during this time, it's not called Birth of a Nation, it's called the Klansmen. And I have 20, I have 25 minutes left or, okay. I need to talk faster. <laughs> so it's interesting when you do research on the, on the Klansmen that's just shown across America and many places before it's shown, there are protests, or after the first night it's shown, there are protests. Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, the NAACP go, goes out and protests, black churches, but also white allies. There's, there are a lot of white pastors who write articles and go out and protest and say, you cannot show this movie because it's going to set back race relations. It shows African Americans as vile creatures, as bestial savages who just want to rape white women. Um, and there, there are protests. There are protests in Los Angeles, so much so that um, the censor boards have to cut out particular scenes from the movie that show African Americans in a, this very savage way. And scenes were cut, off, cut out in Los Angeles, in the Bay Area, and across America. And there are protests. Now, in all my research, um, in these newspapers, the only town where there wasn't a protest I could find was Fresno. Um, I'll skip ahead. Los Angeles is a protest. Um, they had to cut out certain scenes. Here's a local pastor who writes about um, the movie. I'll let you read this on YouTube. I don't have time to read it out, but these are very fascinating reviews of the movie. Uh-oh, it's stuck. There it goes. Here's another review from Fresno, um, a, a glowing review. And I'm just going to set, set, step down and read this. Hopefully my face won't be too much in your... Okay. I'll read part of this out. This is a review from Fresno, a very glowing review, right? Um, in this great photo spectacle, The Klansman, which had its initial presentation in Fresno at the White Theater last evening, Mr. Griffith, the producer, comes pretty near working a miracle. It seems impossible that any combination of human genius, tact, and perseverance could have crowded the story of a great nation to the narrow space of a single drama. Um, let's see, what else? He goes on to say that the KKK were heroes and it's one of the greatest things ever come to Fresno. I can't read it all right now. 
Another glowing review from Fresno. Here's a quote from the, the review. There are in America today thousands of people who believe that the KKK were a band of marauding murderers who spread terror to the hearts of every community through which their mysterious journeys were taken. These men banded together to save the white people from the consequences of the growing Negro power. This is a review from Fresno. And here it adds, Fresno adds for the Klansmen. And many um, theater owners across America hired actors on horseback with the white robes that were taken from the movie and um, prayed up and down during um, premieres. This, in similar ways as movie theaters might hire people to dress up like Superman or Batman during Marvel um, presentations. And this is what gave rise to the, the uniform of the Klan was this movie. Hollywood and real life influence each other. I'm gonna skip ahead. I wish I could talk more of this on this subject, the, the black community here. While all this was going on, there was a flourishing black community in Fresno. And thanks to the Fresno Historical Society for these photographs and testimonies, here was the first black amateur baseball team in Fresno at the same time as we see the rise of the second incarnation of the Klan. Here's this beautiful image of a young African-American woman in Fresno, Miss Minnie Lopez, an early member of the Carter Memorial African Methodist Episcopalian Church in Fresno, 1910. Beautiful image. Um, I, wish I, I wish I could hear her speak, right? Another awesome image, 1910. Bill Palmer, the first African-American man to have a mule train in Fresno. Many African-Americans are coming here, late 19th century, 1910, to flee the violence of the KKK and the harsh imposition of Jim Crow laws and coming out west to places like Oakland, Los Angeles, um, and to Fresno and to make, make a life for themselves away from the violence of the Klan. Even though there was Klan in Fresno, um, we still have a flourishing African-American community. Another beautiful image, unidentified African-American woman, 1895 in Fresno. Beautiful and powerful. I'm gonna skip ahead. This is in, May, in 19, 1922. It was essentially, it was looked down upon to be, the KKK was looked down upon in, on the West Coast and in many ways illegal. Um, the Klegel from the South, Klegel was like a, a clan evangelist, came to California to recruit people. And the district attorney in Los Angeles, um, the police department did a raid and confiscated his uh, membership roles and found that uh, many, um, people from Fresno, well, not many, but 250 in Fresno and the Central Valley were on the membership rolls for the Klan, including many police officers and firemen. And for some reason, lots of dentists and doctors um, are on that roll. I'm going to skip ahead because I have a lot here. Um, here is a float, 1924 Raisin Day float, um, part of my own personal collection. Um, we have the Daughters of Rebecca, which were a fraternal organization, a sororal organization tied to um, a Mason group. But the, what's interesting is that their float is a KKK float. We have the blood cross with a blood droplet. Um, you can see, clearly see the blood cross on the float. 1924 Raising Day float. Right, we see a, a similar blood cross on a, a float from Washington. Same blood cross float, similar in Bellingham, Washington, we see in Fresno, California. 1924, out in the open. This is an amazing um, editorial write-in from someone from Fresno who is telling Fresno readers, look, the Klan is a great Christian organization. They uphold Christian ideals. Um, and I wish I could read this out, but I only have like 10 minutes left. And I want to get to, <laughs> this is amazing. So we know that in Washington, D.C., I have 10 minutes left. 
In Washington, D.C., there was between 20, 35 and 50,000 people that came to march on Pennsylvania Avenue. In 1924, one of the largest Klan rallies I have found in my own research happened right here in Fresno, at the Fresno Fairgrounds. Over a week-long period at the Fresno Fairgrounds, it was predicted 75,000 Klan would show up. There was a great excitement all throughout California and the Southwest. Klan organizations were coming to Fresno. After it was all said and done, if we can believe their newspaper reports, 50,000 Klan showed up in Fresno, California in 1924 to attend this Klan rally. And the flyer is amazing. It's, I don't want to say it's comical because it's not something to laugh at, but the language is interesting. So around 50,000 showed up. The population of Fresno is only 45,000 at this time. Here's the flyer. Ku Klux Klan statewide fiesta. <laughs> Interesting choice of words, right? Fiesta at the Fresno Fairgrounds. It, it took place over a week-long period in May 1924. Fifty thousand. This is from the New York Clipper newspaper. Fifty thousand show up. There were life-size Klan dolls you can buy and take home that were dressed in Klan regalia. There was dances. There was there was there were weddings. At night at the at the racetrack, there was a, a Klan airplane with a fiery cross that went up and down, and people oohed and awed at it. Right? There were Klan speeches given by pastors who espoused Christian white supremacist ideals. Here's a close-up of the flyer. Statewide fiesta and public ceremonial. A whole week long, Klan speeches and a great time had by all, right? Big Klan wedding, big public ceremonial, monster ceremonial. And Klan from all across the West Coast and the Southwest converged on Fresno in 1924. The newspapers say 50,000 arrived. Everybody welcome. I doubt that. <laughs> um, but everybody welcome. This monstrous fiesta and frolic is being staged and directed by Stanley and Dewar. Um, look at all these clan chapters that are coming. San Joaquin towns, clans from Oakland, San Francisco, and the Bay District, Sacramento, Stockton, Modesto, Merced, Madera, Tulare, Dinuba, Porterville, Clovis, all over the Central Valley, Long Beach, Venice, South Santa Barbara, Ventura, and many others, all came to Fresno. I want to skip ahead. These are all amazing original source documents, but I want to end on it. This is a photo taken at um, the baseball, City College Baseball Park. 1925, the induction of um, Klan members taken by Pop Laval. Okay, here are some voices, early African-American voices from Fresno. Um, the Fresno Historical Society interviewed um, African-Americans in 1976. So here's one, William Bigby Jr. Um, born in Calusa, California in 1892. My mother was born in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1872, and she came to California with the Reverend Edward Lindsay and her mother and her four daughters and one brother. My mother was 15 when she came here. She was the eldest of six children. Let's go down. Why did your family come to California? To get away from racism. That was why they came to California. My father came also to get away from racism in Georgia. My grandfather wanted a better life for his children than he had when he grew up. He didn't want his children having to fight the KKK like he did. Fought them single-handedly as a boy and a young man at night. Can you recall any specific experiences he might have had with them? Can you recall any, yeah, sorry. Grandma also had an experience with the KKK. My grandmother said that one night the KKK were running down. They didn't have any streets, they had roads then and someone took a shot at her in a black neighborhood. And she said she was taking care of a little baby, and she had this little baby in her crib by the window, and she said the KKK shot up every window in that house and ran out, lifting the baby up 
out of the crib, she ran out into the back. And fortunately, that baby was unhurt. And my grandfather said that he could remember that they would be riding down the street, the road. The horse hooves were padded, and they had these white hoods over their heads. And they would, Ku Klux, Ku Klux, Ku Klux. And he said that they would, would string a line across the road just where it would strike the horse, and the horse would fall, and that would compel automatically. The drivers would go over, you know, the riders rather would go over, and that's the way he fought the Ku Klux Klan. Dr. Fontes, I was just going to say, take, take, feel free to take 10 more minutes. Okay, you, okay. Got as long as you need. Okay. So the, the, the question I asked at the beginning, why, why do we study the Klan? And I think especially at this time, it's important because we see the rise of, of not only similar groups, but here we have, we have a modern day Klansman um, in very re recent times espousing white supremacy. And the rise of the Proud Boys and similar groups who espouse white supremacy. May, do not be fooled by their rhetoric when groups like this say we're not racist, we're Western chauvinists. That's code word for white supremacy, if you really get at the heart of the matter. Four thousand African American men re were recorded to have been lynched by white supremacists during the Jim Crow era. If these were 4,000 white men who were lynched by black groups, that group would have been outlawed long time ago. Why is the KKK still allowed to exist in America? And any of you young students who are listening right now, I want to call upon you as, as you become involved, politically involved, to push for legislation that will see the outline of groups like this. This is not exercising your First Amendment right. This is a terrorist organization that has terrorized African Americans since 1865. And they, it's my opinion, my humble opinion, they should not be allowed to exist in America. It's up to you to see that happens. Hopefully it does in, in, my, in my lifetime. Right, we have this image of the storming of the Capitol just a couple weeks ago, or maybe last month now. Here's the Confederate flag. And I know there's great controversy surrounding the, the Confederate flag, right? Many groups will say this does not represent racism. This represents my great, 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 great granddaddy who fought in the Civil War, it represents our culture. I'll let you decide what that means. Let me ask you this question. Wait, it, what flag is this? What, if I were to ask you what year this, this flag was from, what would you say? 1865, 1870, 1920. This is a Mississippi state flag that was only changed last year in 2020. And it had the Confederate battle flag as a main symbol in the flag up until last year. This is not ancient history. These ideas persist. And many in, the, in Mississippi will say, well, that does not represent racism. That represents our culture. From my viewpoint, it represents a culture that was founded upon white supremacy. Here's another interesting fact. <laughs> Mississippi... This is interesting. Mississippi did not ratify the 13th Amendment in the outlaw into slavery to 1995. <laughs> That's not a coincidence, folks. I mean, they may have laughed about that in the State Department. We haven't ratified the 13th Amendment. I can hear backroom chatter. The battle flag and that um, fact go hand in hand. I just, it's tangential, um, but, right? Modern day KKK. This is not 1865. This is very recent. Why are they allowed to exist in America? Canada just outlawed the Proud Boys last week. They see them as a terrorist organization. Why is, it, why is the Klan still allowed to exist? Recent images, Black Lives Matter movement against 
a white supremacist, I'm guessing, with the Confederate battle flag. And as, you, as we study history, we know there are certain, certain code words. If you're, if, you, if you're an historian, if you're a student of history, we know that there are certain code words throughout time that far right groups have used and espoused white supremacy. And one has been America first. And we've seen that code word, that phrase used recently, right? By none other than our former president. Now I'm getting political. <laughs> America first. This is, this is a, a, a phrase that white supremacists have used in American history, right? David Duke, the former head, he died recently, the former head of the KKK, said, great Trump speech, America first. This all goes hand in hand, right? These code words, um, white supremacy, make America great again as a code word, code phrase. So going back to the KKK, last night as I was finishing my presentation up, um, I thought, well, about around four, three years ago, there was controversy in the Tennessee State House because there was still a bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest in the Tennessee State Capitol, a bust there as a hero, even though he's the first grand wizard of the KKK. And, I, and last night I just Googled him to find out if where that bust is an am <laughs> amazing, uh, amazing coincidence. Yesterday, when I Googled his name, this Tennessee legislature ruled on this idea of taking out his bust. The bust is still there in the Tennessee Capitol. And just yesterday, they said, we'll, we'll put off making a decision until March. <laughs> so he, his, his bust is still there. You can go to the Tennessee Capitol State House and walk in and see the first Grand Wizard's bust, still there. So this is why we're still studying the KKK, because it matters. The influence is still there. Two minutes I have, I have two minutes. Amazing coincidence that this happened yesterday, right? And here is Tennessee Senator Brenda Gilmore who walks by this bust every day when she's in the Capitol. And to her, this is not ancient history. This is not 1865. This is in her face right then, the KKK in her face. She has to deal with this every time she walks by this man's bust. And she says, tears come to my eyes every time I get off that elevator and look at the forest bust. Senator Brenda Gilmore said emotionally. She's not seen a war hero. She's seen someone who was a slave owner, KKK leader, and most likely terrorized her great, great, great grandparents or someone um, uh, very fascinating that this is still, this is living history. This is why we study the KKK. It's happening now, right? White supremacist attitudes are still prevalent in our society. And I'm gonna end up on this. I'll end up on um, this good note. After the Civil War, African Americans who, were, um, who lost track of each other, think about this, right? Um, uh, slave owners had the absolute control over the lives of black people. Um, babies were ripped out of the arms of mothers. Toddlers were sold off to other plantations in other states. Marriages were disrupted, families destroyed, and afterwards, Many African-Americans who were free took out ads looking for their loved ones. And you can read about these, they're on the internet. And this is an amazing story. These two young people who were separated found each other in Fresno. <laughs> After a separation of 45 years, George Harris and Mary Brooks, who were slaves upon the same plantation, met in Fresno yesterday. And each having lost a loved one, they decided to finish their life together as they once planned. They had lived in an old plantation in the state of Louisiana and were lovers when in 1859, Harris was sold to a planter living in Tennessee. When I first read this, I cried. So I'm trying to get emotional now. They both married in after years. Harris is the father of 17 children, while the, while the woman is the proud mother of 14. By chance, they met yesterday. 
and today went to Reverend Father McCarty of St. John's Catholic Church and were married. Miss Harris has lived most of her life in Chicago, coming to Fresno on a visit to relatives. Her old sweetheart is a pioneer resident of this city, a black pioneer in Fresno. I love that, right? Harris is 61 years old and she is 60. The couple will finish their days in Fresno County at Harris's home, north of town, where the large family of 31 <laughs> will be raised in old plantation style, 1904. So I'll end on that, that um, note of hope and joy as these two people found each other again, once again in Fresno and lived out their days in love and joy of family. And that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Fontes. Uh, thank you for, for such a um, informational, very interesting presentation, much needed presentation. Uh, we do have some questions. The first one is coming from Homer and I am going to unmute you, Homer, and let you ask it. Okay, um, the question I have is that during the uh, May 1924 rally in Fresno, the week-long rally, were there any reports of any African-Americans or people of color being injured um, during that um, rally? I haven't found any in my research. Um, in fact, none of my research even mentions African-Americans um, during this time. At, at, at this time in Fresno history, there are a, a few hundred African-Americans living in a very segregated part of Fresno. Um, and I don't think any of, any of them would have ventured to the KKK rally, but no, I don't have. In fact, um, in my research, there, there was very little violence from what I found. Now, it could have gone unreported. There's very, very, very little violence done at the hands of the Fresno KKK. Bakersfield, on the other hand, had a lot more violence. Bakersfield was a hotbed of clan violence. And we know that Bakersfield's history um, is Bakersfield is a, is a new South in many ways and throughout Bakersfield history. And white supremacy um, has been part of Bakersfield history. But not, not in Fresno, I didn't find, find anything, no. Good question. Thank you. All right, we have another question that was sent to me via the chat. Um, <clears throat> many Fresnans don't understand or know the history of the KKK here in Fresno. Why do you think that is? Oh, well, this is something, not something we're taught, right? I mean, f I think local people don't know, don't know a lot of things about history. Uh, th at one time, there was 10,000 yokuts living here that are essentially all gone now because of the genocide. We don't learn about them in elementary school. We don't learn about them in high school. We don't learn about them in college. I often ask my college students, can you name the, 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 the tribe, the people that lived here for 10,000 years, and none of them, only maybe one person knows? That's a travesty. So... We, we learn about things in elementary school, right? We, we make um, these cute little um, tricky cutouts of the pilgrims. We don't learn, we don't learn about the, the, um, the genocide that they ushered in. We learn about the Holocaust, but we don't learn about the Indian genocide. How can you teach elementary school kids about the horrors of slavery? Um, when we learn about Martin Luther King Jr. in elementary school, we're not taught that he was fighting white supremacy. We're taught he was fighting for black rights and but why was he doing this? Because white supremacy was part of the American structure, right? Of, of the government, the institutions. We're not taught those things. Um, so, yeah, we're just not taught, <laughs> unfortunately. Thank you, Dr. Fontes. We do have another um, question in the chat. And the question looks like it, it reads, wouldn't the Fresno be flipped from being conservative to, to more liberal, and I'm actually going to rephrase that a little bit. <laughs> some, from some of the things that you showed, some of the clippings that you showed, it looked like um, the newspaper articles were somewhat complicit in the, the KKK meeting and um, being able to advertise here in Fresno. Do you have any comments on that or, or any sort of insight? The, the Fresno Bee was originally the, called the Fresno Morning Republican. And during the late 19th century, early 20th century, newspapers were, were political. So it was called the Fresno Morning Republican because it was a Republican newspaper. You also had the Fresno Democrat, which is a Democrat newspaper. Now at that time, the Democrats espoused s Southern culture and, and there was even a, a, a pro-Democrat newspaper in Visalia, which was um, a Confederate newspaper during the Civil War. Lincoln had to send a, the Union Army down to smash it because it was printing anti-Lincoln newspapers. 
Um, but the Fresno Bee at first was Republican. And it was um, founded by um, Chester Rao, whose family was connected to Lincoln in, in, um, in um, back east or the Midwest um, before they came over to Fresno. But as far as conservative, conservative to liberal, um, I'm not going to answer that question because I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Go ahead. Thank you. And uh, another question that was sent to me, do you know of an update to change the name of Euless Park being, um, do you have an update on that park's name being changed because John Euless was a Klan member? Yeah, so I don't have an update. I know that um, the president of this, uh, Fresno City College is at the forefront of that name change, right? Um, one of the names that was on the Klan rolls when um, Los Angeles Police Department confiscated the membership rolls from the Klegel in 1922, one of the names was John Euless. Um, so he was certainly a Klan member, but I don't have a, a, at this moment, I don't have an update on the change name, sorry. Thank you so much. Any other questions? More questions, I love these questions. Any other questions? Looks like we do have another one here. Uh, Dr. Fontes, how do you think we should teach our young ones about that? Well, that's, a, that's such a hard question, right? Because um, we, we learn about slavery in, in, in school and we learn about heroes like Martin Luther King Jr. and um, the Underground Railroad. But how, how much can we really teach, teach the elementary school kids about the horrors of slavery? Um, about ripping out ripping away from a mother, a four-year-old, and selling, her to a plant, selling the baby to a plantation, or the raping of black women by the, by the white slave master. And, you know, there, 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 there are instances we have of reports of Europeans traveling across the South and coming to plantation where most of the slaves look white because the lineage passes through the mother. And these slaves are like third generation and they've been mixed because they, they're constantly being raped by the slave owner and his sons. And by the third generation, these kids look white, but they're still slaves because their mothers were slaves. How do we teach that to kids? Mm -hmm. I, but I think that and certainly in high school, we should s stop watering down history, stop whitewashing it and teaching some truth, certainly by high school. Thank you, Dr. Fontes. And um, there are I'm going to take two more questions here. I'm actually going to combine a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> what role do you think schools have in um, preventing students from joining and, and idolizing or joining groups like this? And then if we combine that with another question, where would be a, a good place or good resource to go to find out about this and, and get some historiography on it and um, as the person in the chat writes, to, to learn about the unbiased true history? Well, I think schools have a great responsibility, but um, how do we enforce this? Um, I, I also believe in academic um, freedom, um, even at the college level, right? History professors have a choice. We, we, we pick and choose what type of history we want to teach. You can, you can take a class um, in any, any college, and you may, you may not hear very much about black history. Um, because we have a academic freedom. You might only learn about presidents and, and wars and not about the Black Panthers. I, in my American history classes, I teach about slavery. I teach about um, my black heroes, um, Huey P. Newton and stuff like that. But um, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer because, the, because local school boards um, run schools and, and we have state curriculum and... Um, I'm not sure what the answer is on that. I, 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 think, I think perhaps this, this new ethnic studies law that we have to teach ethnic studies in schools is perhaps one, a good way to answer this, that um, students understand that um, there are many voices in American history, not just the white voice, but um, Chicano, African-American, Asian, all of this, this great penelope of, of experiences and voices go up to make the, the great American experience. And, and when, when young kids in high school schoolers understand this, there's a myriad of voices and experience in American history, I think um, we learn empathy and we have a, great, great, a better society because of it. As far as resources, just buy books on Amazon, be an avid reader, um, read books, 
when someone walks into your house and let them see your collection of books. Wow, you've read all those books? No, I've read three times more. Be that kind of person. The resources are just a click away on Amazon, $10 for a book on slavery, the Civil War. It's up to you to be an avid reader. Thank you. We do have one more question. Um, and then uh, Abby said that uh, wants to know when your TED Talk is going to be Dr. Fontes. <laughs> so we're, we're waiting for that to come out. Um, uh, and then for the last question, a uh, question sent to me, do you think the race that Racism that came from the Wilson administration is similar to um, racism that came to later administrations, and this person specifically mentions the Trump administration. Yeah, well, I don't think racism came from the Wilson administration. He was just espousing something that was prevalent and embedded in American culture. And it wasn't just the South, right? I mean, when we think of slavery, we think of the South, but at one time, every state had, was, slave, was a slave state. At one time, Rhode Island, Rhode Island was founded upon the idea that there wasn't going to be any slavery, but when the, the founder died, it, slavery came to be in that state. But at one time, every state in the Union was slavery, was a slave state. White supremacy isn't a, a Southern phenomenon only, right? This is why that, that document, um, the Cornerstone speech, is so important that this influence, many of the people who came out West were from the, were for, were from the Confederacy. There's a reason why uh, many right-wing groups are forming in Oregon because that Oregon Trail started in Missouri and went straight to Oregon. Uh, many people from the Confederacy went to Oregon. Um, anyway, I'll go off on a tangent now. Well, thank you again, Dr. Fontes. And to, to end it here today, I'm going to call on our Vice President of Instruction, Monica Chahal. She has to unmute herself. <laughs> Sorry, I was waiting for someone to unmute me. I couldn't <laughs> unmute myself. Um, Dr. Fontes, thank you so much for um, for this for this hour. Um, it was powerful, um, very hard to watch at, at times, and, and details, of course, that were hard to listen to. But your passion and your knowledge um, are tremendous, and I, I do hope you'll have an opportunity to read. Um, in the comment, the impact that you had on all of us participating today. So we'll be sure to, to save that chat and share that with you. And we're very, very grateful for, um, for you sharing your, your knowledge and your passion with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think everybody would join me at this point if we were in person, but we'll do it virtually in, in um, sending you our, our love and thanks and, and applause electronically. Thank you. I'm honored and very grateful to be here. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Fontes, and thank you to everyone for coming today. Again, it is being recorded, and we will make sure that we get it captioned and that we get it up hopefully within the next week up on the college's YouTube page, and so that way um, anyone who missed the presentation can see it later. Again, thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much to Dr. Fontes.